Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here in Montpellier today in your wonderful city. Uh, so, I'm the spokesperson for the Human Brain Project, which, as Magali has just said, has just uh, won itself a bit more than a billion euros of funding from the EU. And you might not be surprised to know that the theme of the Human Brain Project, next slide please, the theme of the Human Brain Project is the human brain, which some people think, and many people have said, is the most complex organ on Earth. It's this organ which allows us to organize meetings like this. It's this organ which creates music. It's this organ which speaks, which writes poetry. And it's an organ which, next slide, has something like 80 billion neurons in it, 80 billion individual cells, which are connected by something like 80 trillion, uh, 80 trillion connections or synapses. But there's something which is particularly miraculous about all that. Even though this, you have this forest, you can, the genome, which contains the blueprint of the human brain, can be written down in about one and a half gigabytes. One and a half gigabytes for a computer person is not very much. If we just go on and look at this machine here, this machine, which is a very old-fashioned one, because I buy cheap ones, uh, has 32 gigabits in it. So in just 5% of the space here, I can put the whole of the blueprint, actually for the whole human body, but for the whole human brain. And that is a mystery. And that leads to two questions. There's a scientific question, which is how on earth do I m go from this very, very relatively short, compact description to this immensely complex organ which writes poetry? That's a scientific question. That's fascinated me my whole life. And then there's a practical question. How can I find out? Now, one of the greatest scientists in the greatest physicists in the last... Uh, 100 years, was uh, Richard Feynman. And he said, if you want to understand a complicated system, you should build it. So that's what we do. We build brains. What that actually means is we build simulations of the brain, models of the brain in huge supercomputers. And you start getting out things like this. Maybe I can bang something and it will come. Uh, you get these wonderful simulations. Now, the theme of today is actually medicine. So you have a right to ask, what's the, all this got to do with medicine? Well, if your iPhone breaks down, you, if you want to mend it, it's not good enough to just know how to use an app. You have to open it up and look at all the pieces inside and see which piece isn't working. You have to actually understand the internal mechanics of your iPhone. And we think simulation and modeling is the way we should do that. Now, there's a lot of objections to this vision. Some people say, but look, you've got these 80 billion, 80 billion neurons and you've got 80 trillion synapses. You know, measuring them is difficult, we know that. If you measure all of them, You'll just never get there. It's going to take a centuries to do it. So they say, you're, you're, you're trying to do something completely impossible. But I'd like to remind you that the description of, of all that is this one and a half gigabytes, which fits 20 times inside this little phone. And that suggests that there's some underlying simplicity there, that there's some basic principles. And it's the existence of those principles that mean that a project like ours is feasible. So what do we, bang, what do we actually do? Yeah, uh, what do we do? We sort of fill in a jigsaw puzzle. We get data about the brain from all over the world. We get data about brains of different species, different parts of the brain. We get different levels of detail. Some people tell us about the molecules. Other people tell us about the circuits. Other people tell us about the forms of the neurons. And we put it all together in a jigsaw puzzle. And as we do so, slowly these principles of simplicity, which make the modeling possible, 
begin to fall out. And I'd like to just tell you a little story about just one bit of this, which we're actually doing ourselves. Uh, we, it's been known for a long time that neurons come in different shapes, type, shapes and sizes. This is not something we discovered ourselves. But you have pyramidal neurons, you have basket cells, you have Martinotti cells, and you can carry on naming them for a long, long time. So we start off with a taxonomy of neural types, a classification. Then we start counting them. In our particular research, in this particular bit of the story, we look at the cortical column of a rat. That's a very small part of the cortex of a rat, which is divided into six layers. And we count how many cells of different types are in different parts. That's difficult, but it's definitely doable. So that's stage one. Uh, stage two, we get, actually get neurons, we stain them, we color them, we put them under a microscope, and very painstakingly, we make digital models of the shape of the neuron, the three-dimensional shape. We make the three-dimensional shape just like the figures you see in a video game. So you can turn it round, turn it upside down, shake it around, do anything you like with it. And we uh, measure its electrical behavior using this wonderful equipment here, which is called a 12-patch machine. You don't have to remember that, which actually measures the electrical behavior of the cells. Now, once we've got all that, a little miracle happens. Because what can we do? We can create a model. You, we take neurons in the right proportions. So, so many pyramidal cells, so many of this size, so many of that. The right proportions for that bit of the brain. And we put the digital models inside our virtual space. And lo and behold, we find that the fibers of these models touch. And we know when, when they touch, that can form an electrical circuit. So, instead of measuring every individual synapse, which we agree with everybody else is completely, we can't be done. What we've actually measured is the shape of a finite number of cells. We've done some counting. And we have the circuitry falling out on its own. It's not quite perfect, but it's very, very good indeed. And we know that actually in real life, that circuitry that is fine-tuned by the person's experience, but I'll come to that later. And once we've got a model of the circuit, bang, we can move it onto a supercomputer, and we can actually simulate how that circuitry works. So we can inject a simulated current into the circuit and then some cells will start firing, their signals will travel down the fibers, go to other cells, they'll start firing too, and so on, producing these wonderful pictures we have here. And we can take that model, we can examine it statistically, we can, it, we can compare it to the data we have from real circuits, we find out what's wrong, because it's not perfect, we correct it, and we slowly get better and better. Now, one of the things which makes our work possible is because the brain has lots of repetition. You don't actually need to, do, to measure every neuron, because they're very similar. They're even similar between different species or different parts of the brain. And we don't have to measure every single individual cortical column, because they too are very similar. Certainly, they're not identical. But we can take a basic model, and then we can tweak it. We can make it more perfect. And so we can build bigger models much faster, just like you know, moving from a single transistor, which they had in 1957, to this thing, which has many millions, it didn't take millions of years, because they were repeating themselves many, many times. And we can take information from other groups, and we can look at the long-range connections between these different areas of the brain, and start those, putting those in the model as well, until we get to a whole brain. This is not a human brain, this is a rat brain. That would already be a huge achievement. We're not there yet. But we can gradually build up a complete, detailed, working model of the healthy human brain. Now, that's the healthy brain, but the theme for today is medicine. And in particular, it's diseases of the brain. Now, there was a report uh, last in 2011 from the European Brain Council which estimated that the total cost of brain disease for the European economy 
is something of the order of 800 billion euros every year. And we're talking about diseases like depression, uh, like schizophrenia, like autism, uh, like anxiety, like the de degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. And these diseases, we're in a bad way today because we have great difficulty in diagnosing them. We don't have a lot of knowledge about their causes. We can manage them. We've much improved the standard of living of people who have these diseases, but we can't cure them. They go on forever. And actual research into these diseases is being reduced because the drug companies have had a huge number of failures. They're very expensive failures, and they think it's better to, to invest in things where they have a higher chance of success. So we want to use our models to work on these diseases. How? Well, when you have a disease of the brain, it's because something's gone wrong with the brain. That doesn't mean necessarily that the cause of the disease is a gene or chemistry. It doesn't have to be that way. Maybe it's something in, in the environment. But even uh, when it's the environment which is causing your disease, this affects the brain. It changes it physically. If you have a kid who's been grossly abused, you're going to find a lot of changes in that kid's brain. You might find a reduced hippocampus. You'll find a thing called the HPA axis is going to work differently from usual. So you have a physical disease. But when a doctor sees a physical brain disease, he sees lots of things. He sees the original cause of the disease. He sees things which have been caused by the disease. He also sees changes which have been caused by the drugs used to treat the disease. And it's extremely hard to untangle all this. Now, this is where modeling comes in. What do we want to do? Just like we collect data about the healthy brain from lots of different sources, we want to collect data about the diseased brain. Hospitals today, if you go and you have a brain scan, the neurologist will look at it for a few minutes and make a diagnosis, and it will go into an archive there it will remain, and probably no one will ever use it again, will ever see it again. We would like to take this data, anonymize it, so you don't have people looking at it for reasons they shouldn't be looking at that, and um, make it available to medical researchers. So the first job is to look, find groups of patients who have similar conditions defined in biological terms, and extract what we call biological signatures of disease. Now, biological signature is a set of changes in the brain which differentiates that patient compared to a patient with a different disease or compared to a healthy patient. Then we can take those and we can start playing with our model. We can take one aspect of that signature and tweak the model to reflect it. So, say we think that the neurons are hyperactive, we can tweak our model to make the model neurons hyperactive as well. We see what happens. Maybe it doesn't produce anything. Nothing happens. So we know that was some secondary effect which doesn't matter so much. Maybe it produces the whole cascade of effects we're getting in the disease. Then we found a cause. And once we have a model of the disease, then we can also model possible treatments. Now, and, and obviously the goal is to get better treatments. Now, we don't want to promise miracles. Uh, this is going to be a long, slow process, and nothing, nothing we do gets rid of traditional medical processes. Even if we find interesting things, or if people who use our platform find interesting things, you'll still have to test them in animals, you'll still have to do clinical trials, it will still be a, a very long, slow process. But our goal is to accelerate the search for new treatments, to make it better. And it's a very simple calculation you can do. If we could reduce the cost of brain disease just by 1%, and that's not being too ambitious, that's 8 billion euros a year in Europe alone. And that would pay for our whole 10-year project eight times over. So we think we're onto something. Now, that is actually the, my most important message. But before I end, uh, before I end, uh, I want to address some other questions, Pe things which people always ask us, and which I think we shouldn't try and escape from. So people say, you're trying to build a model of brain on a huge supercomputer. And they say, are you going to make an artificial brain? 
Is it going to take over the world? Is it going to be more intelligent than us? Is, is it dangerous? You know, is it going to be an alien? Uh, well, there's a very, very straightforward scientific answer to that. The answer is no. And it's not just because we're extremely nice people, though of course we are. Uh, it's for a very good scientific reason. I said the brain was plastic. Now, the brain changes in every moment of the life of a child, the life of an adolescent, the life of an adult or an old person. Every time you hear a sentence, every time you eat a food you like, every time you listen to some wonderful music, your brain changes. Some synapses get stronger, some get weaker, some disappear, some new ones form. And it is this process of continuous change in the brain which makes us what, us are, what we are as human beings. Now, we don't actually model that process. We don't do it uh, part, largely because we don't have the knowledge to do it. We have to know our own limitations. Partly we don't have the computational power to do it either. So this is something way, way out in the future. For the moment, it's science fiction. We can't model development, and for that reason, we are not going to produce artificial brains which take over the world. Which means, of course, that my original dream, understanding how to get the one and a half gigabytes to write poetry, is not completely resolved. We're not go I'm not going to see that, I don't think. But, you know, I'm a scientific romantic. I got interested in science when I was about eight years old, and I saw, I listened on a very crackly wooden radio to Alan Shepard being the first American in space. And a few years later, I was, uh, I stayed up with my parents very late at about 4 a.m. in the morning to watch the first man walk on the moon. And that excited me. And I'm excited by understanding this problem here. And I think we are going to some, get some understanding of it. So for me, now I'm personal more than the project, we do have a moonshot. We want to at least be able to reproduce simple bits of human brain function. If we could reproduce just the first acts of a baby when it starts to learn to talk, that would be resolving a scientific problem which uh, has been open for 2,000 years. How do human beings think? No one knows. We want to give, put new light on that question with lots of medical results coming out from what we're trying to do. So, that's our moonshot. That's why we've asked for the money. And if we can get there, I think it will be a small step for our project, but it really will be a very big step for human knowledge. Thank you. Thank you.